Okay. All right. Just gonna wait for people to start trickling in here for a moment. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome virtually to Green Apple Books on the Park. My name is Casey, I'm a bookseller here. Before we get started with tonight's event, I just wanted to go over a couple housekeeping announcements for the store. Um, we have a lot of upcoming events planned and I wanted to let you know about a couple that are coming up. Um, for anyone who was anticipating our virtual event with Jamie Lowe tomorrow, um, it has been postponed until Tuesday, August 24th. Um, Jamie Lowe is the author of Breathing Fire, a book about female inmate firefighters on the front lines of California's wildfires. Should be a great event, so we hope you can join us on the 24th. This Thursday, we will be hosting um, a live in-person event for those of you in the Bay with poet Kava Akbar. He'll be reading from his new collection, Pilgrim Bell. It's gonna be at 6 p.m. at our 9th Avenue location. But if you can't make it in person, we will also be streaming it via Zoom. And as always, the full calendar of our events is on our website, greenapplebooks.com slash event. We have um, Zoom links in the details of all of the events. And also, if you've missed any events that you wanted to attend, many of our online events are posted to YouTube. Our channel is just Green Apple Books on YouTube. So with that said, um, we're very thrilled to welcome David Hoon Kim and Kevin Brockmeyer in celebration of David's new novel, Paris is a Party, Paris is a Ghost, which I have right here. Hopefully you can see. Um, we do have copies available for purchase in our stores and on our website, greenapplebooks.com. And we appreciate your support of our event series and of the authors who are able to virtually tour with us. It really helps keep things running. And um, one more thing. Um, please feel free to utilize our Q&A function and leave questions for the authors tonight and they will try to address them by the end of the hour. So with that said, um, yeah, without further ado, <laughs> um, I want to introduce um, Kevin, the com uh, conversation partner for tonight's reading. Um, Kevin Brockmeyer is the author of multiple novels and story collections, including his ninth and most recent book, The Ghost Variations, a collection with 100 stories. His writing has been published in such publications as The New Yorker, McSweeney's, Tin House, and others. And he's been awarded three O. Henry Prizes, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Penn USA Award, and more. He also teaches at the Iowa, Iowa Writers Workshop. Uh, Kevin, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Green Apple for hosting us tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce David and then he will read to us. Uh, so it's my delight to be joining David Hoon Kim in conversation tonight. I began reading David's stories in the fall of 2005 when he took a class I was teaching at the Iowa Writers Workshop. So when I say that I've been anticipating the novel we'll be discussing tonight for a long time, what I mean is that every six months or so, for a decade and a half, I've been typing his name into search engines, hoping to see news of a book contract. Reading those early stories of David's, I felt a sense of revelation and deep pleasure. The same sense of revelation and deep pleasure I felt earlier this year when I read Paris is a Party, Paris is a Ghost, and just last week when I read it again. David is one of those rare writers, and his is one of those rare books whose imagination seems to grow bigger rather than smaller each time you encounter it. There's something about his approach to fiction that not only generates a deep sense of mystery, but allows that mystery to remain intact. His stories cohere, they always feel fulfilling, but they transgress against John Updike's formula for a satisfying story, that it end by giving a sensation of completed statement. The concluding notes of David's stories leave you confident not that a statement has finished being made, but that a question has finished being asked. Paris is a party, Paris is a ghost, makes itself whole by way of echoes and insinuations, rather than through typical lines of rising and falling action. As a result of which it keeps generating new possibilities instead of foreclosing them. At one point, the book's narrator, Henrik, describes the enigma of his life as one in which anything could be a message, but most things weren't. I would describe this novel the same way. 
I want to say a brief word about David's prose, which is masterly and not exactly like anyone else's. His writing possesses a carved out, elegant, visionary quality, but he often brings a sly humor to it as well. Take this passage, for instance, from the opening Sweetheart Sorrow section of the book. I told Fumiko in a library whisper about my new job, the lofty apartment, Clarisse. I described Monsieur de Gadbois from the wrinkles around his bulldozer mouth to the creases on his moai-like forehead. Fumiko had always been fascinated by the physiognomies of old men. The first time she visited my room, she had, after examining my meager shelf of books, spent several minutes studying the photo of Samuel Beckett sitting on the terrace of the Closerie de Lila that I had taped to the wall. She loved the faces of W.H. Auden, Adolfo Bioy Casares, James Frog Eyes Baldwin, even Sir James himself. Old pairs, she called them, for some reason, in her childish French. I kept thinking as I read this book, which is filled with paragraphs like that one, that there was a quality about it that was at once classical and contemporary as if somebody like William Blake was being filtered and refracted through somebody like Haruki Murakami. David studied creative writing at the Sorbonne before he arrived at Iowa. Afterward, he studied at Stanford University under a Stegner Fellowship. He has received additional fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the McDowell Colony, Yaddo, and the Elizabeth George Foundation. His writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, and Ninth Letter, among other publications. I'm going to hand things over to David now. He'll tell us a little about Paris is a Party, Paris is a Ghost, share an excerpt from it, and then the two of us will have a short conversation. I have plenty of questions for him about this truly fascinating novel, but I'll also be sharing your questions with him. I intend to privilege those over my own. Please then, if you're curious about anything, you can type your questions at any time into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, so silently from the other side of your monitors, I hope you'll join me in welcoming David Hoonkamp. Oh, great. Thanks, Kevin, for that um, great intro. And thanks also to uh, Green Apple and, and thanks, Stacey, for hosting this uh, uh, talk. Um, so um, to talk, to kind of uh, talk about a little bit about what uh, Paris the Party is about. Um, I always have trouble uh, summarizing uh, like what, what, what things are about. So um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna do a very good job of it, but um, so it, it, uh, it's more or less about uh, just what Hen um, Henrik's relationship with, it consists around Henrik's relationship with Kumiko uh, who he meets in Paris, where he goes to uh, further his studies, uh, like many other people. And um, it's basically about uh, his life after her death by suicide. So it's just kind of, um, uh, it, it's also, I think, about the passage of time as well. So um, I think um, um, it follows his life through, um, his years in Paris and um, like as he continues to live there after his studies where he becomes a translator and just the kind of people he meets and so it's, it's also about his encounters with people and uh, just um, the people yeah just things like that and um, as well as um, um, his relationship also with the daughter of his uh, one of his classmates at the translation school where he um, and so it's kind of, yeah, it's just, it's just about, uh, it, it, yeah, just to him trying to connect with people and not succeeding very well, I guess, that too. And it's also, it's, you could say that it's also about loneliness as well. So, um, yeah, I think, I don't know, that, that about sums it up. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, was there anything else that I should uh, talk about? 
Well, I mean, it's an intricate book. Um, and, you know, I'm sure we'll get into discussing some of the twists and turns it takes in our conversation. Um, would you like to read a passage to us before we get started? Yes, yes, sure. Um, so I'm just going to read a short passage about his time at the translation school that I mentioned and um, just um, it'll kind of give an idea about like what it was like for him to be there and things like that. So um, so this is after he gets, this, this is about like him getting an assignment there and a transition assignment. And so uh, it just kind of describes what that assignment was like. Um, so we were, we were given a week to translate Moray's poem into English, which to me seemed excessive. An entire week to translate six small lines. I couldn't help but wonder if there was something else something more that Michaels, who's the, te the, 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 the teacher of the class, uh, wanted us to discover. If perhaps the poem might be a litmus test, a shibboleth for translators, his way of asking us a question, though I wasn't sure what the question might be. My initial effort was a word-for-word -word translation. A crow landed on an island in the middle of a river. The discerning bird, equally pedantic and clever, did it for the rhyme. With my next less than literal translation, I attempted to reproduce the rhymes of the original. A black jet alighted on an islet there amidst the rivulet. The corvo, clever little thing, did so for the archi archipelago. I had maintained the poem's principal element, the bird, the piece of land, the body of water. But Moray's plain vocabulary had been swallowed up by my feral language. Over and over, I retranslated the poem, toying with different registers and styles. As I tried to replicate in English, Moray's registers and styles, uh, I'm sorry, Moray's elusive voice. For most of the week, I worked on the poem and little out. The more I poured over the words, the more I became convinced that a week wasn't enough. A lifetime wouldn't be enough. I gave up on meter and then on meaning as well. A crow took loose a papa chateau near a mound of snow. A crow perched on a garret in the shade of a chestnut. A weasel stood on, a easel, on an easel within a patch of teasel. A lizard shook its gizzard amidst the blizzard. A mink sipped a drink on a kitchen sink. By the end of the week, the original crow had become every animal under the sun and performed, for the sake of the rhyme, all manner of aleatory acts. The words themselves were not important. Marais doggerel was not dependent on meaning at all. Was that, I wondered, the answer to Michael's uns unspoken question. Pro the estate, smartest bird I ever met, did it for the couplet. I didn't know, I didn't know what methods my classmates opted for, what conclusions they arrived at. No doubt some chose to translate the poem literally and were done in a few minutes, while others took longer to find a suitable compromise between the literal and the idiomatic. The purpose of the exercise, I imagine, was to demonstrate the difficulties of translation in the face of which a good translator must always find an adequate solution. You are not translating a language, you are translating a text. That was what Edward Michaels had told us at the start of the semester. A good translator is neither faithful nor unfaithful. A good translator goes beyond content and form to reveal the impossibility of defining a language. I think I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, so, it's a beautiful novel, David, and a haunting novel. Um, and the kind of novel that has kind of elements of storytelling that in the months after you finish reading it, it's hard sometimes to remember where they came from. Like, were they part of this novel or were they something that I dreamed about independently? Um, like, it, it was not until I came back to its pages and read it again that I recollected, oh yes, this is why I've been thinking about like this line of storytelling for the past few months because I encountered it uh, here in Paris is a Party, Paris is a Ghost. Um, so I'm gonna start things off uh, with a handful of questions of my own. Um, and then I'm gonna start turning my attention to the Q&A box. Um, so I hope anybody who's attending, if you have questions, uh, please leave them for us uh, and I will make sure to pose them. Um, uh, it, you know, and then I'll have additional questions of my own to weave into the conversation. Um, but to begin with, um, it, this is a novel that 
does not proceed like most novels do. Uh, reading it, I thought about a claim that the Italian writer Gesualdo Buffalino made about his novel, The Plague Sower. Um, and I'm just gonna read this. Buffalino says, I must confess that the first chapter I wrote was born of a difficult game. The challenge of finding plausible interconnections among 50 words chosen beforehand for their common tone, color, and evocative charge, the legitimacy of which I would not hesitate to defend. Since in my case, the connections were neither fortuitously rhythmic as in obligatorily rhymed sonnets, nor esoteric, nor Kabbalistic, but born of a kinship and coalition of expression and music. Um, the translator of the book goes on to say in its introduction that this is a dizzying confession and enough to make any translator's head spin. Um, and yours was a book that made me think a lot about the kinship and coalition of expression in music, uh, and also about what it means to translate. Um, so this is a very long introduction uh, to a question. Um, what I wanted to get around to asking was what was your structuring mechanism for the book? Um, I think of it as a novel that does, it work, does its work by braids and repetitions and near repetitions. Uh, I was looking at the, the cover of the book, which is this kind of intertwining Eiffel Tower um, spiraling up into the sky. And that struck me as an apt symbol for the kind of work it does. Uh, so how did you go about piecing this book together? Um, first of all, that, that's a really interesting um, quote that you read, and I, I have to say it kind of makes me want to re read um, Buffalino's book. Buffalino, yeah. It's a yeah. beautiful book. Uh, he has maybe half a dozen books available in English. That was his first, published in his 50s and came very late to the page. Wow, yeah, I see. Yeah, okay. Um, so to kind of talk about like how I wrote, the, how I went about writing the book, um, you know, to be honest, Initially, I was just trying to write uh, self-contained short stories, each by themselves, and, and that were interconnected, obviously, by the same narrator. So that's what I was trying to do initially. Um, and um, I think, I think in retrospect, it's kind of funny that um, looking back on them, what I've noticed was that the later stories are actually more. Or actually, or less contain, self-contained as you go as you um, progress in the book. So, um, for example, I mean, like I, I think the stories in the third section are not—they don't, in my opinion, they don't hold hold up very well as as um, individual stories. And I find that kind of interesting um, thinking about that because um, actually, I didn't write those stories in the order. I didn't write the stories in the order that they appear in the book. So, for example, I wrote the stories um, in the in the third section uh, before I wrote the second section. Um, the, the the middle section, which details his arrival in Paris, his first year in Paris, um, and I wrote the last section of the last uh, chapter of the first section after I wrote the third section. I, I, after I wrote the second section. So I wrote that last, the, the, the last chapter of the first section. And so given all that, I find it, I find it kind of, um, um, I don't know if this is a good thing or not, but I, I find it kind of interesting that uh, the, 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 the later stories actually uh, almost seem to take into account that the reader has already read the first and second sections. So, um, but I, I guess as, as short stories, they don't, that, it's probably not a, a very uh, good thing to not be very self-contained, but. Um, the thing about it is, I just, um, despite the fact that it says a novel um, on the cover, I, I actually don't know if it's really, um, I think you could see, think of it as, I, maybe it is, maybe it's more like something, maybe it's not, it, I, I wonder sometimes maybe it's, if it's neither a novel nor a, a collection of short stories, or maybe it's both in the best places, but I don't know, it's not really, I guess it's not really up to me to say that, um, but. I have my doubts. You're well, you know, I mean, it's a work of fiction, right? So you're making me think about right. Jennifer Egan and a visit from the Goon Squad. And she, right. I think, was very vocal about the fact that she did not want the word a novel on the cover or the word stories on the cover so that readers could just approach it as something fresh. Um, you know, like you, I, I think most of the longer books I've attempted 
have always begun as efforts to write self-contained short stories? Were you trying to get a running start, basically? Um, are you more comfortable in the short form? Um, am I? Um, I don't, I almost think I'm not really good at either. <laughs> so um, I don't know. I think in a way right now where my interests lie, I'm more interested in writing longer things. I, I don't find that I've, I don't find that I've done very well with, with the short form because uh, uh, I don't seem to find them any easier. I don't seem to find that, it, it, I seem to expend as much effort writing something short as I would something longer. There are stories that I've been working on for, I don't even want to say how many years and I'm still not done with them. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm more interested in the longer form. Well, I mean, I, I, I feel as if I should shore up your confidence when it comes to your short fiction, because I have, remembered stories that you wrote 16 years ago now uh, for all this time and have been, I will be enthusiastic to read a collection of stories by you if, if it makes its way into print. Um, That's nice to just say that. Um, um, so really, I think. The, the first section of this book was published as a self-contained short story, uh, Sweetheart Sorrow it's called, yeah. in The New Yorker. Um, around, I think around 2008, is that right? 2007, yeah. 2007, okay. Um, you were interviewed at the time by Cressida Leishon, uh, who uh, had a number of interesting questions for you. And in response to one of those questions, you mentioned that you see yourself as, and I'm quoting you directly here, an inhabitant of the French language, a denizen of the Korean language, and a citizen of the English language. I was hoping you could talk with me more about those distinctions. Um, yeah, um, first of all, thanks for reading that really, really old interview. Um, I can't, um, I think I was, I was, I think I was much younger when I, when I said those things, although I do, um, I don't disagree with that yet, um, still. I, I still agree with it, but um, um, I think initially I, I said those things because um, I probably said a citizen of the English language because it's the only language that I am also a citizen, uh, that I also hold a citizenship to. And um, for example, inhabitant of the French language, I was probably thinking of something that um, the, the, the French or Romanian writer, Joran, has said once, which is that he, that one doesn't inhabit a language, uh, one doesn't have, one, ha one inhabits a language, not a country. And I, I totally agree with him because I think to an extent it's probably true for most writers, if not all writers, that it's your, your one's the country of one's language, that mm -hmm. language one writes in. Um, but um, I do think that, um, to answer your question, uh, that, my, that my relationship to the, the three languages that I know are, are quite different um, because the circumstances that in, in which I use them daily or not is different. So, um, and um, I think also, uh, it also has to do with the fact that um, that uh, the 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 way these languages are viewed are, are also very different. I think um, in my experience, for example, writing in French I think is very different than writing in English in the sense that I think it, it's viewed differently, especially for someone like me. Um, I think um, there's when one, for example, I. I when you don't come from, when your background doesn't, when you don't come naturally from a French background, like for example, there's always a the question of legitimacy, which comes into play with French, in my experience. Um, as though I have to have a reason to be writing in French, a very valid, a, a valid reason, because, uh, um, I mean, it seems to me that no one would really question a foreigner choosing to write in English instead of his, instead of his language. Whereas I think, um, in my experience, I've always been—it's always been a question of why I would want to write in French if I if I can write in English, and it just also seems to me that uh, writing in French, I've also can't help but feel that uh, it, it, it's when I do that that I'm most seen as being American, for example. Um, whereas no one questions the fact that I'm writing in English, for example. Um, I don't know. So it just seems to me that that's also why it's different for me. My, my, my relationship to 
to the French is different because of the way it's seen by the ex by the outside world. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I don't know if that really answers the the, the question, but um, so in, in a way, I can't help but have different relationships relationships with those languages because it's kind of exterior forces, but also because um, and and to, and to put it more simply, I also on my end, I don't practice those languages in the same way. Um, I, considering I live in the U.S., I use the I use language I use English every day, whereas in a way, like I don't have the same um, connection. I don't have the same uh, access to um, a francophone world, for example, and um, and and so on. So um, I don't know if that really. Um, no, that's. That's great. Is there a French publication scheduled for Paris as a party, Paris as a ghost? Um, no, there isn't. Um, there, there, I would definitely, um, I don't wanna, I'm definitely interested um, in uh, a French publication, but I think one of the things I've noticed also is that um, in a, like I would, I would, I, it seems to me that uh, writing about France when you're not French is very hard to publish one's book in France because the French, they expect a certain kind of writing from an American, from American writers. Yeah. So in a way you're kind of in like a no man's land, you're neither, you're neither French writing about your own country, but you're not an American writing about America. In a way you're like this thing that, it's kind of ex extraterrestrial, so yeah. I, I I feel like it would be it would be hard to get it published in France. So um, I'm, I would yeah I would love to be public. I would love for the book to appear in France in in, in French. So I, um, I hope it happens. Um, yeah. you know, I I've noticed the same thing about French taste in American literature. Um, like I don't none of my work is set in France. Um. But it doesn't read to a French audience as what American literature is supposed to be either. So I think I've had a very hard time like attracting mm -hmm. any kind of readership there. Um, right. On the idea of it, you were you were focusing on the word inhabitant, and uh, you know it just it did cross my mind that inhabitation um, like is another word for haunting, um, kind of in a, in a more obscure sense. Um, I've known. Uh, there's a writer named Donald Harrington uh, who wrote a book called Whiff, uh, which involves spirits, hauntings, uh, but he doesn't call them ghosts. He calls them inhabitants. Um, so it does strike me as, you know, a way of binding um, like several of the themes of this book together. Um, I mean, I want to ask you one more question before I begin taking a look at the Q&A box. I've got many more questions of my own, but if anybody who's listening would like to uh, pose some questions, um, I will keep my eye out for them, and I'm happy to pass them along to David. But before I do, uh, in the same interview for The New Yorker um, years ago, you, you brought up something, a fact that I did not know about you. Uh, which is that you grew up wanting to be a comic book artist. Um, and I wondered if you were still drawing uh, and whether you've actually published any work in that medium. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I haven't really been seriously drawing for many years, um, unless you count random doodles here and there. I, yeah, I actually did want to become a comic book artist all through um, most of later childhood and high school, but it didn't really get, go beyond high school. Um, um, and so, and even then, I think, although I did try submitting stuff to Marvel at the time, I think it was a bit of a naive thing in, in that sense that I didn't, I was too young, I was probably to really have developed a style or, I mean, I think I was mostly, no, probably, surely imitating my favorite artist at the time. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I um, but your question does kind of uh, make me uh, wonder kind of what would happen if I hadn't uh, shifted interest or, or however you want to call it and from uh, drawing to writing. Um, uh, because I think um, 
I mean, and, and not to say that I would have that that I know that I'm sure I would have made it or something as a comic book artist, but I think it would have been interesting to just. I mean, it kind of make, it kind of makes me wonder what um, would have happened if I had continued drawing, because I think um, unlike writing, there is really only one um, quote unquote language, the language of drawing. I mean, drawing is drawing, so I I feel that I wouldn't have had. Um, I, I I feel that for one thing, I would be much less um, conflicted as as an as a as an artist than I would be as a writer in, in the sense that I wouldn't be uh, conflicted between two languages, for example, you know, because you can't really, there's really only, I mean, you can obviously change styles of drawing, but I think really there's really only one one language of drawing. So sure. and I don't know. So kind of makes me wonder. So like me, did you grow up reading mainly the superhero comics, DC and Marvel? Is Was that? Yeah, I was mostly Marvel. I was more Marvel than DC. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I didn't. Um, yeah, so for example, I'm I'm not at all familiar with like the French comics or European comics at all. Mm -hmm. There was no real. I, I didn't have access to that growing up. Okay. Um, we do have one question so far in the Q and A box, uh, and it is: When did you live in Paris, and how long did you live there? Um, in Paris, I lived there for about four years, but I lived in France for about eight years. And uh, you know, you were studying at the Sorbonne. Did you just uh, did you remain for an extra four years after you finished your degree, or did the degree take longer than four years? Yeah, I I didn't I I got the group I got I obtained the equivalent of what would be a master's degree and then it was it's more like a transition transitional degree and then I started my doctoral thesis um uh, thesis but I never finished it so I didn't um yeah I didn't obtain the most important degree though the the end degree the terminal degree but yeah so I was yeah I was when I left I was still technically a student. Okay. Um, well, I mean, speaking of that course of study, um, I mentioned in the introduction that you studied creative writing uh, in three different, these very prestigious three different institutions, uh, the Sorbonne, the Iowa Writers Workshop, and uh, Stanford University under the Stegner program. Um, I wondered if you could tell us a bit about the ways those three distinct programs uh, shaped you as a writer. Um. Uh, yeah, I, I guess to put it put it very simply, I learned to to write in I learned to write in French at, when I lived in France, and I learned to write in English when I when I came to Iowa. Um, but also, I think both creative writing in France and, and in the U.S. at least at that time was very it's very differently approached in in the sense that um, in, in France you it, it's more like a recreational thing where the writing is done in class. So it's obviously very short things that you write. You have under limited time, and you read them afterwards in front of everyone, and then everyone reacts to it. Uh, so the critiques in that case are not very they're not very detailed. And afterwards, if you want to, you can obviously take it home what you wrote and then develop it, bring it back to the teacher instructor of the workshop. So um, and then and then for feedback. So um, whereas obviously in the U.S. It's more. It's a degree. Pro I mean, it's a. You get a degree at the end, and you also um, uh, have much more feedback. But in a way, I think it's. I I found having a lot of feedback from very all these different people in the in in, in uh, American workshops. Right. Um, I didn't always know what to do with all that feedback. So in, in a way, like I think the most productive time I had, for example, at Iowa was when I was able to work one on one um, with the visiting writers. Are you still there? Okay, David, um, if you can hear me, uh, your video has frozen. Um, so I hope David can rejoin us momentarily. Unless it's my video that's frozen. Is Green Apple still there? Can you tell me? Yeah, we're still here. Um, why don't we give David a moment to rejoin? All right, you're back. You froze up for a second there, David. Um, and uh, your mic is muted right now. 
Okay, I think, yeah, sorry about There that. we go, okay, you're back. Um, yeah, yeah. But just as a awesome. point of curiosity, um, I think you had finished answering the question, but I am curious, well, you had, you'd not told us anything about the Stegner program yet. I'm curious about that. Um, but also just as a point of personal curiosity, you studied, uh, you workshopped with me at Iowa. Um, who were your other workshop instructors while you were there? At Iowa, um, I also worked with uh, Ethan Kanan. I, okay. I was in his workshop, um, um, and I was in Frank Conway's workshop. Um, but uh, uh, for medic, I mean, because of for medical reasons, he I couldn't. It, he didn't finish the workshop that I was in, and then uh, someone else took over. This Venison took over, and so it was a kind of a transitional. And then, yeah, I think I also was in a workshop with uh, Marilyn Robinson. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what about the Stegner program? Um, who did you uh, overlap with there? Uh, what did it operate differently than Iowa did? Um, overlap with you mean who were my who was already there? Like you mean my workshop classmates? Yeah, well, I'm curious about that, and also who your who your instructors were. Um, um, yeah, I, I guess I guess at Stegner it was different because everyone had the same three people. Um, you don't you don't really get to um, choose as in Iowa, so um, yeah, so. Tobias Wolf and uh, Adam Johnston and uh, Elizabeth Talent were there when I was there. And I think, um, yeah, so. Okay. And uh, yeah. All right, again, I'm keeping my eye on the Q&A box for anybody in the audience. Um, but I have some questions about, I'm always curious about the reading lives of the writers whose work I admire. Um, a lot of the books I love best, I discover because I come to understand that writers I admire, admire those books. Like I, I sort of follow a line of recommendations uh, to kind of formulate my reading life. Um, so I'd, I'll kick it off with just a couple of questions about your reading life. Uh, I'm wondering what was the book you loved best when you were a child uh, at say 10 years old? Um, yeah, um, to be honest, I wasn't much of a, I was, I was reading more comic books than, than books then, although I did obviously read books. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say that what I was reading then um, was, a, was quite a hodgepodge. So I was, what I recall is I was, um, I recall reading books uh, by William Streeter. I don't know if you, um, as well as um, some Tintin and um, uh, Dean Kuhn, yeah. <laughs> things like that. I mean, yeah. it's quite a, quite a, quite a, Interstellar um, Pig is that William Sweet? Yeah. All right, that's the only one yeah, I know. That, yeah, that's his. That's his most well-known book. Um, my favorite of his was uh, the Singularity. So, okay. which is which is about like this, this great tale of sibling rivalry and um, time dilation. So, but yeah, that was my. One more reading question, and then I've got another from the Q and A box. Um, so I asked you about your reading life as a, as a child. As an adult, which book have you reread more often than any other? Um, I would say um, one of them is probably the, the Real Life of Sebastian Knight by um, Vladimir Nabokov, mm -hmm. um, which is the first book that he wrote directly in English, and also um, which he which, which wrote uh, just before leaving for America in Paris. Um, I, he, he finished writing it just, just mere weeks before the arrival of the Germans in the capital. So, uh, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, like, it, I, I think it, it's an interesting work because I think it's just a, he wrote it in English, but it's, it, it, it contains so many, um, it, I mean, it contains, it's, it has such a strong uh, French presence because of, our, uh, like, like many of his other works actually, but um, it also takes place in Paris, but so. Uh, anyways, I just think there's a it has a it has quite an energy to it that that I really admire in, in the prose. Okay, um, so the Q and A box. Uh, this may be an amateur question, but I'm curious if you try to emulate the writing style or approach of a favorite writer, or you just do you just write how you feel. And what made you go to the Sorbonne for writing rather than somewhere stateside? Um, yeah, to answer that last question, I didn't actually go to the Sorbonne for writing. Um, it was just, um, I went there to, um, 
I went there to study comparative literature because that was what I was studying. So I transferred from another French university to the, to the Sorbonne to study uh, comparative literature. And it's only uh, just the friends that I knew there who were also aspiring writers who, it was through them that I found out about writing workshops in Paris. So that wasn't the only place where I studied creative writing. There was also other places where I also studied it. So yeah, now, it's not really known for creative writing. I don't know. Um, the, the, the Sorbonne. And the, the first half of the question was whether there are writers you emulate or whether you're just pursuing your own uh, aims. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are writers I emulate um, because I personally find it very hard to write without emulating someone. I mean, and um, the obvious answer to who uh, I might be emulating is obviously the writers that I read, read and reread a lot, you know, people like Nabokov and I don't know, Beckett. Uh, Roberto, Roberto Bolaño, I mean, people like that, that I'm always rereading, reading and rereading. So yeah, I can't imagine that I'm not emulating them on some level, you know, in my modest way. It's hard to know sometimes who you're emulating. Um, right, yeah. I'll have some, some more questions about your reading life a little later if there's time for it. Um, but there's another question in the Q&A box, uh, which is by the same questioner, and it's a follow-up, uh, which is what and when inspires you to write? Uh, what and when? I guess those um, are two questions, maybe. Yeah. Um, I I guess as for what it's more it, it, once again it's 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 the books that I'm reading it's the books that I've read and it's, it's the authors that I'm always reading and going back to that inspire me to to write when I'm. Um, yeah, when I when I'm when I happen to be reading something and um, and it's not not necessarily to imitate exactly what I'm reading at the moment in, in a very conscious way but once again just because of I don't know an emotion something that I might feel mm -hmm. while reading something so I don't know it's, yeah something like that so in, in other words just, just other writers and their works that I'm reading um, as for when um yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Um, I mean, I I try to write regularly. Um, I don't always succeed, but I try to write, I try to write um, as much as I can. So, yeah. your your answer to the what question is exactly the same as mine. Um, you know, there are just there are books that kind of awaken you or reawaken you to the possibilities of literature, and you you feel. Right. You feel as if you want to be part of it and in conversation with those books in some way. Um, yeah, it, it, definitely. Like it is, it is a way to kind of. Re, re, I don't know. It's it's a response to something too. It's 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 not just um. Yeah, I should have said that. It, it's also a response to something I'm reading in a way, like as a kind of yeah, as a, maybe as a kind of conversation. However, however one way. So yeah. Um, so again, I'll keep my eye on the Q&A box, uh, but my next question for you is about uh, obsessions. Um, there's a writer, I don't know if you've read much or any, J.G. Ballard. I imagine he's a writer you would respond to, um, but he speaks frequently about fiction writing as an art of obsession. And I'm going to read another quote. He said in an interview, presumably all obsessions are extreme metaphors waiting to be born. That whole private mythology in which I believe totally is a collaboration between one's conscious mind and those obsessions that one by one present themselves as stepping stones. So um, the idea of obsessiveness and of extreme metaphors both seemed apropos to me when I was thinking about this book. Um, you were working, it's a novel you were working on for a long time. Uh, the earliest pieces of it were published in the New Yorker way back in 2007, you said. Um, and I'm curious particularly about the obsessions that drove you to write it. Uh, what were the obsessions that gave birth to the book? Um, did they remain constant while you were writing it? Did you have the same obsessions when you finished writing the book as you did when you began writing the book? Um, I think they were the same. Um, and, but, but at the same time, I, um, so th yeah, they remained the same because I think, or I like to think that the book is about Paris and that is obviously something that I think about a lot and that I continue to think about a lot 
from when I wrote the first chapter and the, the rest of the book. Um, it didn't actually take as long as it might have seemed because there was actually another novel that I worked on for a long time that didn't quite work out. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. to be honest, I, di I didn't spend all these years working on just one book. Um, yeah. But at the same time, so there's like this, I, 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 I feel that, and I don't, obviously no one would know that. So I, I feel that there's like, um, so there was another book that I worked on for many years that didn't work out. And then after that, I started to work on this book. And so, um, but that book was also about Paris. It was, it was, it was a historical novel about Paris. So um, I can't help but feel that there's like kind of like a ghost of that book um, kind of hovering over this one, even if um, thematically or, or whatnot, I don't, there's obviously no, it's not like this was in reaction, this was a continuation of that book or anything like that. But yeah, so there's that kind of, that might explain why the, the large gap between the, the the first chapter and you know the, the, this book. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you did mention in that same interview uh, with the New Yorker that it had crossed your mind that you might want to return to Henrik and his story. Um, right. Yeah. And so it was interesting to see that you did, like all these years later, return to him and his story. Um, uh, again, I'm keeping my eye on the Q&A box if there are questions from the audience. Um, but you mentioned earlier in response to another of my questions, you talked about Henrik as the narrator of the book. Um, I want to ask you about the second chapter, uh, the second section. Uh, first of all, do you think of that section as belonging in some way to Henrik and his narrative force? It's the only section of the book, I believe, that's not written in the first person. It's kind of a second person voice, uh, kind of telling us the story of other characters in this field. Um, so, so you're asking like how I see it connecting or how I see it fitting into with the rest of the nar narrative? Yeah, or? yeah, well, I'm curious. I've got an alternate question about that chapter as well, which is just about its material. And I'll, I'll ask you that in a second. Um, but I, I guess I'm asking, does that chapter also, but it certainly belongs to the novel um, and it has a wonderful effect on everything that follows. Um, does it also belong to Henry? I guess is my question. Um, I like to think it does. Um, um, I'm not sure how much I should say it, but I'm, I, I, I think, um, um, it's a kind of weird second person because it could be just a, just a normal second person, but I think it could also be um, a kind of, um, I'm not sure what you call it, but where someone is addressing someone, it mm -hmm. could be, the you could be like an ad address. Um, um, but I think, to be honest, I, I, I did try to take that section out I, because it, it, I felt that it ultimately, I mean, in, 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 on some level, I felt that it kind of, like you said, it's, it's the only section that isn't pulled from his point of view, it's the only section that is not first person. But I, I, I found that I couldn't, that the book was missing something without it. So, um, yeah, so I, I think it does raise questions, that chapter, but at the same time, I can't raise the book without it. So, so therefore, it, it's there. <laughs> so it's there. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that it's there. Um, it's a beautiful yeah. piece of writing. Uh, it helps to give shape to the book. Um, you know, I'm thinking about uh, William Maxwell, who's a, a writer I adore. And like, he often got into conversations with his editors about um, material that they felt his books could do without if he chose to strike it. And he almost always chose to keep it in place. He has a wonderful short novel called So Long, See You Tomorrow, which has a chapter from a dog's point of view and his editor said, this is a great book, but you've got to get rid of the dog. Um, and he just could not bring himself to do it. And everybody who has read that book in the, uh, what I guess the now 40 years since it's been published has remembered and been moved by the section that's from the dog's point of view. So sometimes you just have an instinct. I mean, I think your instinct was right about this chapter. Um, I mentioned Ballard. Ballard uh, had training before he began writing. Uh, in medicine. Um, 
and specifically in, you know, he knew the human physiology very well. Uh, he had training in dissection of uh, kind of human remains. And that's what I wanted to ask you about this second chapter. Um, like a very simple question, which is maybe naive, but basically I was just curious, that section involves medical dissection. And uh, I was curious how you knew so much about that subject. Um, yeah, I, I actually didn't initially. So I, it, it is a product of a lot of research, mm -hmm. but I didn't actually research a lot of that um, when I was writing the story because it's actually um, the fruit of another story that I didn't end up, that I ended up abandoning for which I did that research already. And um, so when I was at Stanford, where I looked, I went through their archives and I also went through other, several other archives of other universities in, in, the, in the area for um, just looking at uh, manuscripts and things like that, anatomy manuals and things like that. Um, so yeah, it, it was a lot of research, research that I did for another story um, that didn't happen. So it's almost like it's just kind of like just kind of like kind of kind of like how the book itself is um, came after another book that I didn't end up finishing. That story itself also came after another story that I didn't end up uh, finishing or it didn't work out. But so all that I had, I had amassed quite a lot of documentation that I was able to then use for this story, um, for which I did additional research. I I, I think if I if I recall. Um, but yeah, I'm really glad you think that it, that, um, or I don't know, I, I hope you think it worked. The, the research didn't seem too um, overwhelming or too unwieldy, but yeah, that was what happened. But no, I mean, um, absolutely did not seem too unwieldy. And not for a second did I doubt that you knew what you were talking about. Um, like if you had told me you had medical training, I would have believed it. Um, okay, well, it seemed like wholly authentic to me. All right, so there's another question in the box. Um, Maybe not a question to the author, but just to you. I'm an English learner and would like to know what level is this book, high school or college? Um, thank you so much. Um, so who, who, would you, who would you recommend, David, is the uh, kind of appropriate age level for reading this book? Um, I, I think most of the book is not very complicated. I mean, I don't, there are no like, uh, but I think there are possibly certain vocabulary that is a bit uh, um, not quite common, but overall, I would say that I don't, I tend not to, um, it's not a very complicated uh, style. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really a stylist, so I don't know. I don't consider myself one, so I don't think it's a very, um, well, at least I try not to, so right in a very complicated way. Well, I, I mean, you can, uh... I consider you a stylist um, and you don't have to be ornate um, right. or showy to be uh, a, a good stylist. Um, so I, style is very important to me. And like, I will dismiss a book within a page uh, if I feel the author is not attending properly to his sentences. Um, I never had that impulse with this book. Like it, I, I could tell that you were giving your sentences their due and putting them through their rigors. Um, but I agree with you that uh, it's not, that the style is not um, forbidding. I, I think somebody with kind of a high school, like a good high school reading level, uh, I think would be able to appreciate this material. Yeah, um, let me ask you uh, uh, some a few more questions about your reading life. Again, keeping my eye on the Q&A box. We've got about five minutes left. Um, so uh, in your personal library, uh, which writer is represented by the most books? Um, I would probably say Nabokov. Is, yeah, I, I probably have more books of Nabokov than any other writer. But actually, I'm not really much of a, I'm not someone, I don't, I, I don't feel the need, I don't, I tend not to read everything someone has written if I like a book. I tend, I, I, I tend to gravitate more towards individual books than actually um, all the works of an author. Mm -hmm. Just that's how I uh, tend, to, tend to read things, but there are obviously exceptions, so. Have you read um, Nabokov to completion? Or I, I have not read every single thing he's ever written, no. I don't, okay. yeah. I, I don't Sebastian really Knight is the one that's most important to you? Um, yeah, I, I also like his early Russian novels, like um, Laughter in the Dark um, 
and inquiry may as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, but but his American his American period is, is good too. Um, Min is a good one. Okay. Uh, um, what about your recent reading? Is there what's the best book you've read this year? Um, you know, I have actually have not read much many books, so I don't know if I can really answer that. Uh, um, I, I'm actually reading a lot of books at the moment and not finishing many, but um, well, not because uh, I don't want to. I'm I'm just in the midst of reading a lot of, a lot of books lately. Yeah. Okay. Um, I noticed today that you had a piece on Large Hearted Boy, um, a, a playlist for this book. Um, and I always enjoy reading those. Um, and uh, it, your taste in music is fascinating to me. Um, I, I wondered if, are you the kind of writer who will listen to music while he's working? Uh, is there a way in which the music you enjoy fed this novel? Um, yeah, I definitely listen to music when I'm writing, uh, I, at all stages. So, um, but, um, and you know, in, in the novel, there, there are actually certain songs that from that list that appear, um, that play a, a minor role as a sort of like, um, I don't know, I don't want to say maybe not backdrop, but, um, there are details, um, they, they kind of work as details in the book. So, yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, of course, of course. So we are very short on time. If anybody has an, a last minute question, I'll pose it to David. Um, here we go. Um, just to thank you. Uh, Sylvia is very excited to meet us and thank us for the opportunity. Um, so, I mean, I enjoyed it as well, David. I think this is an amazing novel. I'm so glad that it's made its way into print. Um, I hope that all of you who are tuning in, if you haven't already purchased the book, uh, will purchase it from Green Apple. Um, and uh, maybe if they can retake the screen, uh, they can tell us how to go about uh, picking up the book. Yeah. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Um, to yeah, what to what Kevin said, we do have copies of the book for sale. You can pick them up at any of our locations in the city, or you can order them at greenapplebooks.com. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone who attended tonight and asked questions. And thank you so much, Kevin and David, for um, speaking with us. It was so great to hear from you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right. Have a great rest of your nights. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Bye. Um. Bye.